Welcome to the War Academy channel. Today, we continue with the series we are doing, about the most powerful divisions of the Second World War, it is the turn of the Lieb Standart. Since it was the most requested in the previous video we made about the Grobes Dukeland. This unit that we are going to see today, is the elite formation par excellence of the German army, and as we will see, it was present in practically all the actions of the war, from beginning to end. On the other hand, we also have to point out that because it was always in the vanguard, and enduring the most intense combat. After each campaign the formation had to be practically reconstituted again, due to the enormous number of casualties suffered. This formation was created in March 1933 with the aim of becoming Hitler's personal guard, replacing the SA troops. Until now, they had had that role. Initially it had 120 members, but little by little its number increased. The small unit, which was nothing more than the Führer's Praetorian Guard, had its exclusive uniforms, the most striking element being the white belts they used. With regard to physical standards, it was the training that required the most requirements. A height of at least 1.78, a certificate of their family tree that went back almost two centuries for officers, and above average physical and intellectual aptitudes, were one of the necessary requirements to enter it. By 1935, the Liebstand Dart was constituted as a motorized infantry regiment and already had about 2,700 members. Already in 1936 they participated in the march of the German army on the Rhineland, as well as in the annexation of Austria and the Sudetenland. As a curiosity, and despite their hard training and preparation, their constant presence in protocol acts and various parades, made many ironically describe their members as the asphalt soldiers. His first combat action came on September 1st, during the invasion of Poland. Commanded by Joseph Dietrich, the Leop Standard made its way in its advance from Breslau to Warsaw itself, integrated into Army Group South. During this advance, he took part in the Battle of Bzura, this being the toughest of the entire Polish campaign. Finally, they participated in the siege of the fortresses that defended the surroundings of Warsaw, specifically in Modlin, north of the capital. After the campaign, it was accredited as a very forceful motorized shock unit, this being the perfect tool for the type of war that the Germans had proposed. Due to this, for the following campaign it was decided to enhance it even more. This would come a few months later when the Germans attacked France. For this campaign the Lieb Standard was reinforced with a second company of anti-tank guns, with a greater number of sappers and with its own artillery unit. Finally, a series of Stug 3 type armor was also assigned to it, but when the campaign began, these had not yet been integrated into the unit. The mission that the Lieb Standard had, was to cross at lightning speed Holland in the first place and Belgium in the second. During this operation, the formation provided a perfect textbook example of how motorized warfare should be waged. Combining audacious blows of the hand, and the power of its engines, the unit covered all of Holland in a few hours. They first marched on Nijmegen hurriedly across the Rhine, and then made a sharp turn west to Rotterdam itself, where they linked up with German paratroopers who had been dropped in the area. After securing positions, they headed north at full speed to Amsterdam. In total they traveled 215 kilometers this first day, appearing everywhere and disconcerting the enemy. In addition to their good results on the battlefield, they also played an excellent role as a bait, so that the Franco-British units believed that this was the main German attack since they were using their elite unit as a vanguard. This helped them to drop over Belgium, and expose themselves to German units sneaking through the Ardennes. But the actions of the Lubai Standard did not end here, because as quickly as they could, they began their march again, this time advancing on Belgium and later entering France to support the Dunkirk siege. After this, they would descend through the center of France, passing near Paris to the outskirts of Lyon. The campaign was balanced for this unit with 111 dead and 390 wounded. His commander Joseph Dietrich received the Knight's Cross. Another of the notable members of this unit, 
who fought in this formation participating in all its combats, was Michael Whitman, who commanded a reconnaissance vehicle, this being a 222 half-track. It was for the Balkan campaign when the six Stug three with short cannon were incorporated into the formation, and one of them was already assigned to Whitman. During this operation in the Balkans in which Germany took part during the spring of 1941, the Leopstandart Regiment entered Yugoslavia on April 11 from Bulgaria, in a new very fast maneuver, and ended up making its way to the city of Olympia, already within the heart of the Palapanzi. Once this campaign was over, the unit was prepared for the invasion of the Soviet Union that would begin just a few weeks later. Constituted as a brigade, and with a size of about 11,000 men, the unit initially remained as a reserve during the first days of Operation Barbarossa. It was specifically on July 2nd when the South Army Group was sent, since it was the one that was advancing the slowest. First they headed in the direction of Kiev, and then headed south. Advancing along the north bank of the Bug River, they reached as far as the Crimean Peninsula and continued north across the Sea of Azov to Rostov. This spectacular advance had to be made at the cost of heavy casualties, and it is estimated that by mid-November, when the Soviets counter-attacked in the Rostov area, the Lyub Standard had only 35% of its original workforce in terms of to troops and 15% to vehicles. As we saw in the program about Germany's first retreat on the Eastern Front, the Lyub Standard had to face extremely tough defensive combat at the end of November which forced it to retreat to the Mayas River, along with the rest of the German army. After these winter months, in which the unit ended up suffering terrible casualties, and after months fighting practically without rest, by mid-1942, shortly before the start of the new great German offensive on the Caucasus and Stalingrad, the Lieb Standard it was sent to France to recover and reconstitute itself this time as the Panzer Grenadier Division. With this objective, the division would be equipped with all the most innovative Panzers IV with long cannon and the famous Tigers that were going to be released, among many other armored vehicles. By January 1943, the fully recovered and re-equipped Leop Standard numbered almost 21,000 troops, and was one of the most powerful units in the entire German army. To this we have to add that also with her in France they were re-equipping the Todenkampf and the Das Reich, with similar characteristics. These units would be rushed back to the Eastern Front at the end of January 1943 to stabilize the front after the failure of Stalingrad. Together they would form one of the most powerful bodies in the entire conflict. During the months of February and March they waged fierce fighting around Kalkov and Belgorod, once again securing the front line and setting everything in readiness for that summer's offensive. The Leop Standard lost in these operations more than 4,500 soldiers between dead and wounded. During the months that passed from April to July 1943, they were further reinforced and equipped with the most modern armor. For Operation Citadel, the Leop Standard had a total of 216 armored cars of all kinds among which 13 Tigers stand out, one of them being Michael Whitman's, who for the first time took command of one. This division marched in the direction of the city of Prokhorikva, integrated into the two corps of the Waffen SS, where it fought one of the toughest battles of the entire operation on July 12. After different combats throughout the entire region, she was finally sent to Italy at the end of July, after leaving all her heavy equipment there with the rest of the Waffen SS units. The mission of the Lieb Standard in Italy, in which Mussolini had just been deposed and the Allies were already threatening to invade, after having landed in Sicily, was to occupy part of the country, more than anything, to lift the spirits of the Italians. They also got to have some combat with some local partisans. A little later, in October 1943, it was rebuilt again, this time with an armored division. He again had a force of almost 20,000 men, and more than 200 battle tanks. They included 95 Panzer IV, 96 Panthers and 27 Tiger tanks. Despite these good numbers, after a couple of months of fighting and before even reaching the new year of 1944, the Lieb Standard had completely bled to death in their defensive battles near the Dnieper River. 
to these great losses, which did not even have more than 35 active panzers, we must add that they had to transfer part of their personnel to the new division of the Waffen-SS that was being formed. This, as we have already seen, was the 12th Hitler Jugend Panzer Division, which was made up of boys between 17 and 19 years old, but with veteran commanders of other very experienced units such as the Lieb Standart. Despite no longer being even a shadow of what it had been just a few months before, the Lieb Standart continued to fight hard at the beginning of 1944, participating in the liberation of the German troops encircled in Cherkasy. By March 1944, it had just 41 officers, 137 non-commissioned officers and 1,000 soldiers, with a number of panzers that did not exceed a dozen. This forced that by April she had to be sent to Belgium to recover again. After two months of margin until the front in Normandy was opened, the division once again had 20,000 troops. These soldiers, however, no longer had to go through such rigorous controls nor did they have time to receive such complete military training. When the Allied invasion took place, the bulk of the division could not see combat until a month later, due to the fact that much of it was still in its training period. Once they finished their fully accelerated course, they were dispatched to the zone and placed in the Khan environs. Only one of his heavy battalions, being specifically the 101 to which Michael Whitman belonged, was able to enter into action on June 12, having the famous combat of Villers Bocage, which we also already saw extensively on the channel. After fighting numerous battles throughout the month of July, the Lieb Standard was finally encircled in the Falaise pocket along with other German army units, and had to leave virtually all of their equipment behind in order to escape encirclement. When they finally withdrew, they only had about 6,000 soldiers out of a total of 20,000 they had a month ago. Once in Germany, it was again re-equipped and its losses were covered. We have to point out that this type of divisions had total priority when it came to receiving both man and material, and that is why they were always the first to re-equip. The Lieb Standard would participate in the Ardennes Offensive but after the failure of the German army to achieve the objectives set for the operation, and the pressure that the Allies began to exert on all fronts, by the beginning of January 1945 the Lieb Standard was sent hungry urgently. There he carried out his last, and most desperate battles in his attempt not to lose the Hungarian capital and the country's oil sources, which were the last that the Germans had left. By April 7, the division once again had no more than 1,500 troops and practically no armor. Everything was already lost, but this unit did not stop fighting at any time, retreating little by little to Vienna and then to Tyrol. Finally, between May 8 and 9, what little remained of the division was handed over to the United States near the Austrian-German border at Linz. Well. Here is this video in which we have analyzed the entire service history of one of the most famous divisions of World War II, which is added to the previous two in this series that we have been doing. What is your opinion on the combat performance of this division? And what do you propose for the next one? The books that I have used for the elaboration of this program have been from the Praetorian Guard of the Third Reich by Carlos Caballero Yorado, Michael Whitman as the Tigers by Gary Simpson, and Cursed 1943 by Roman Topol. I'll leave you the links, along with the programs we already did about the Hitler Jugend Division and the Grobes Deutschland in the description. That's all, subscribe and like if you like this program and see you in the next one, see you soon. Mm -hmm.